Hi, I'm Joachim Giannotti from the University of Birmingham, and today I'm going to discuss the methodology and metaphysics of the powers ontology. Let me start with some context. I take that many metaphysicians of science, among other things, are in the business of articulating a ontological framework for the properties of scientific interest, such as those posited by physical theory. In pursuing such an enterprise, theories of dispositional properties or powers, as I shall call them, has gained increasing popularity. As Anjan Chakravarti nicely puts it, like a phoenix with a propensity to rise from the ashes, dispositions have made a serious comeback in much recent philosophy of science. My focus today is on dispositionalism. As I shall understand it, this is the view that many or all fundamental properties are essentially dispositional or powerful. Now, to connect with the themes of this brilliant workshop, my aim is to show that the discussion concerning the characterizations of dispositional properties represents an instructive case for the methodology of the metaphysics of science. I want to argue that some features of powers are, in fact, problematic because they are stipulated from the armchair. However, I also want to argue that some features of powers are to be decided on purely metaphysical grounds. If I'm right, the emerging version of dispositionalism is, to use a label from Thomas Tacco and Matteo Morganti, a moderately naturalistic theory of fundamental properties. So here's the plan. Uh, I shall start with an overview of the powers metaphysics, and then I will be discussing two worries that target two features of powers which stipulated a priori, intrinsicality and an ungroundedness. And then I propose to remedy this extrinsicality and groundedness. And I will be concluded by drawing some methodological morals. Okay, let's start. So before diving into the, to into the themes, let me give you some preliminary remarks. So my aim here is not to defend the truth of dispositionalism. And the dispositionalist package deals includes various benefits that concern the modality Causations and laws of nature. But in this talk, I'm not going to evaluate whether dispositionalism uh, delivers these goods. And lastly, there are many flavors of dispositionalism, and here I'm going to focus on an essentialist version under a very liberal stance about the best way to describe the dispositional essence of power. Now, let me give you a short overview of dispositionalism. I take it to be the view according to which many or all fundamental properties are dispositional. And I shall say that a dispositional property is such that it lies in its nature to confer upon things that instantiate it, some dispositions or causal power. So in this sense, dispositional properties empowers their bearers. So let us call them powers. Now, there are various ways to understand the relationship between powers and the disposition it grounds. And here I'm not going to fix on a specific view. The important point is that I'm going to adopt a fairly standard necessitarian view about the dispositional profile of powers. And this is to say that the power is such that it empowers its bearers in the same way in every possible world. So let me give you an example. So take negative charge. If negative charge were a power, then it would be part of the nature of negative charge to confer upon things that instantiate it, such as electrons the disposition to exert and experience a force as specified by Coulomb's law. A negative charge would empower elections in this way in every possible world. Here's some textual evidence for the view. Uh, for example, we have John Offorn, who says, speaking of dispositionalism, that there's a view in which the causal profile of each fundamental property constitutes the individual essence of the property. Because a property, because a profile, sorry, is both necessary and sufficient for each property. Alexander Burr says the real essence of some potency, the power P, include the disposition to give some particular characteristic manifestation M in response to stimulus S. And lastly, David Yates says that the dispositional essence of a property F is the set phi of disposition such that for any property P, any possible world P bestows P if and only if. P is identical with F. So why being a dispositional uh, essentialist? Well, in the literature, there are direct and indirect arguments. The direct argument concerns the theoretical advantages that dispositionalism brings on itself. Indirect arguments instead concern the merits that dispositionalism has 
over competing views of fundamental properties. So standards or natural opponents of dispositionalism is categoricalism. And categoricalism, we can think of it as the view that it's not part of the essence of a fundamental property, which are called categorical properties on this view, to confer upon things that instantiated any dispositions or causal power. So categorical properties, in a sense, are something uh, distinct or over and above the, the powers that they bestows upon their bearer. And classic examples of categorical properties are structural and geometrical properties. So I don't want to focus on any specific arguments uh, in favor of uh, dispositionalism. What I'm more interested in is that some of these arguments, both direct and indirect, they appeal to science. For example, uh, a, it is said that categoricalism and an argument against categoricalism is that categorical properties are quiddities and uh, science seems to offer no conceptions of negative charge, often says as something over above the thing that plays the charge role. So here's the idea is, is that we should, we should not adopt categoricalism and we should rather by dispositionalism instead because dispositionalism does not, po does not posit quiddities. Mm -hmm. Instead of categoricalism, uh, fundamental properties would be quiddities and science posit no quiddities, so this view, categoricalism, is a bad one. Here's another example of the role of science in uh, considerations in favor of dispositionalism. This is from, from Manford. Uh, he has an argument in, in favor of unrounded powers, and he says, uh, in explaining this argument, premise three, uh, this is the premise that properties of subatomic particles are all dispositional, is supported by physical theory not just as interpreted by philosophers, but also by scientists is interested in this debate. And then Manford in the paper goes on on citing some dictionary entries in which uh, about charge, mass and spin, there are uh, full of dispositional terms and that is supposed to give us some evidence that also scientists uh, think of these properties as dispositional. Another sort of considerations in favor of dispositionalism has to do with the fact that this view provides a ontological grounds uh, in a scientifically responsible basis, uh, scientifically responsible ways for the sort of properties that are posited by scientific practice. So here's the idea is that if we believe into dispositional property of powers, then we can pick up scientific dispositional explanation. Again, so here we have a motivation, like a science-backed motivation for adopting dispositionalism. So there's a sense, what is common about these arguments, of course, we can discuss them in turn. So again, I'm not interested in the soundness of these arguments. What, what I'm more interested for the purposes of the talk is that these arguments share the idea that uh, dispositionalism is a, in some sense, a scientifically responsible view. And here I'm adopting a label from Amanda Bryant who I've seen among the speakers. So Amanda says, the more metaphysical theory engages with the empirical data, theoretical insights or practice of current scientists, the more scientifically responsible it is. So the obvious question is, to what extent is dispositionalism scientifically responsible? And here I want to raise a couple of worries that undermine the scientific responsibility of this view. So the first, uh, so as I said, there seems to me, so this worry is concerned two features of powers that undermine the degree of scientific responsibility of dispositionalism. Here I'm, I'm using a liberal notion of degree. Of course, I understand that it might be a controversial term, but I'm not committed to any specific conception of how to think of the degree of scientific responsibility. But setting this worry aside, so here's, here's are the problematic features. The first one uh, is an intrin intrinsicality. So the intrinsicality is the claim that fundamental powers are intrinsic properties of the variance. And the second claim is an ungroundedness claim, and it is the one that fundamental powers are ungrounded. Now, of course, if you take fundamentality to be a matter of being ungrounded, this should be fairly obvious, but as I will say, this claim is particularly problematic. And what I want to argue is, or at least to suggest, is that to be more scientifically responsible, this positionalism ought to reject both intrinsicality and ungroundedness. And I will suggest a couple of ways to do so. So let's start with the first worry, so intrinsicality. So again, just to give you some, like a piece of evidence that this is actually claimed that it is endorsed by powers theorists. 
So here we have George Morna who says, according to basic physical theory, the subatomic particles have a limited number of essential properties, all of which are intrinsic, basic, and prima facie dispositional. And then classic examples of fundamental powers that you can find in the literature, in the literature are mass, charge, and spin. So here's the worry. The putative fundamental power such as mass is extrinsic, for it depends on the X field. So here's the idea that has been articulated in great detail by Bauer in a paper in 2011. It says that uh, our best science suggests that mass is an extrinsic properties of particles because our best science suggests that uh, particles must be immersed in the Higgs fields in order to acquire mass. So if you think of intrinsicality as a matter of uh, perfect duplicates and you think of a perfect duplicate of a particle, then it doesn't possess mass unless the particle, the duplicate of the particle, is also immersed in the Higgs field. And this would suggest that uh, mass uh, would uh, satisfy the criteria for being an, an extrinsic property against the dispositionalist claim that mass is intrinsic. So this is the first worry. The second one uh, concerns the claims that fundamental powers are ungrounded. Again, this is a claim held by Molnar and Manford does this paper where he argues for ungrounded powers. Now, they think of a ground of a power as something by virtue of which a thing has the power. So the worry here is that uh, putative fundamental powers, again, think of charge, mass, and spin, appears to be derivable uh, from symmetry groups or symmetry structures via symmetry-based considerations. So the, 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 I think it is well known that symmetries play a central role in contemporary physics. And one of the nice things that you can do with symmetry is that you can derive properties such as mass, charge, and spin uh, as invariants under, as invariant parameters under the specific transformations associated with uh, specific symmetry groups. And the fact that you can derive mass, charge, and spin from symmetry groups strongly suggests that fundamental powers are grounded in symmetry groups because you need to have symmetry groups in order to get these powers, right? So for example, of, co of course, this doesn't mean that you can imagine a possible world where you have fundamental powers such as mass, charge, and spin, but no, no um, associated asymmetry structure. But the problem as pointed out by Stephen French in his book is that this sort of possible world appears to be in a sense physically attenuated. So they don't appear to respect our current physics. So if we take seriously a current physics then we should accept that these fundamental properties, even if their powers appears to be grounded in symmetry groups. So here's the worry that the claim the fundamental powers are ungrounded is false. Uh, it should be, I think this should be pretty obvious why these worries matter, but um, let me give you an example why it is important to address these worries. It is important to address them because you can assemble an argument against dispositionalism. Because suppose that you take that dispositionalism is the thesis that many of fundamental properties are intrinsic and ungrounded powers. Well, then suppose also that our best science gives us reasons to believe the putative fundamental powers are neither intrinsic nor ungrounded. And then from these two premises, then you can argue that dispositionalism is false. So of course, this would be bad news for dispositionalists. So how do we proceed? So I want to suggest here a couple of, of remedies um, to uh, deal the, with the intrinsicality and the ungroundedness worries. But before we do that, um, of course, it is worth noting that someone could attempt to uh, resist the worry. So take, take uh, the intrinsicality worry. So one way to preserve intrinsicality is to try to object against the role of the X fields in, uh, uh, with respect to the property mass. So Bowers, for example, has a list of objections or reply in his paper. So that is a possible strategy that the dispositionalists might invoke to uh, preserve the claim that powers are intrinsic. Another way to preserve the intrinsicality of powers is to say that when we think of perfect duplicates, we should also duplicate uh, 
the, the relevant laws of nature. So this is a suggestion made, made by McCready in a, in, a, in a recent book. And what she's saying is that one of the problem with, with Bauer's argument is that when you think of just do, the perfect duplicate of a mass, you're ignoring of duplicating the relevant laws of nature. And if it is a law of nature that um, a particle must be immersed in the Higgs fields in order to acquire mass, then you are considering a scenario in which the test for intrinsicality is violated. So to see whether or not mass is really intrinsic, you should duplicate the particle, but also the relevant laws of nature. So this would be a possible way in which you could attempt to preserve the intrinsicality of mass. Another way to address uh, the uh, intrinsic to preserve the intrinsicality is to follow Molnar, who said that who argues that uh, alleged extrinsic powers are actually grounded in intrinsic, more basic ones. So here's the idea is to say that look, actually mass is not even if mass is an extrinsic power. What happens is that it is uh, grounded in some sense in a more basic intrinsic power. So the point is that what is, what is this intrinsic power? And so this strategy is quite problematic because it doesn't tell us a, an answer to what uh, the, intrinsic, the relevant intrinsic power is and has the unlovely consequence that mass would turn out to be a non-fundamental power. So what I suggest that is a better fix and I think that we should just accept or grant that there can be extrinsic fundamental powers. I think this is a, a, a better way to deal with the intrinsicality worry because it is consistent with live nomic possibilities and the methodology of scientific responsible metaphysics. So here's the idea is we take that it's true that our best science tells us that mass, it is an extrinsic property, then we should just accept it. And so we should revise this positionalism accordingly. And crucially, and this is worth stressing, is that the proposed fix does not entail that all powers are extrinsic. So it doesn't follow from the, the claim that some fundamental powers are extrinsic, that all of them are. So this, again, should be pretty obvious, I'd say. What about the, what about the other worry? So remember that the worry is that uh, fundamental powers against, against the dispositionalists are not ungrounded. So here's, there are two approaches to deal with this claim. And the, the remedy that I suggested that dispositionalists should find a way to accept that powers, the alleged fundamental ones, are grounded. So a first approach is conservative. And here's the strategy simply to restrict the ungroundedness claim to the category of properties. So the dispositionalists could say something like this. Fundamental powers, the type of powers, are, uh, are such that they're not grounded in further type of properties. So they are ungrounded relative to the category of properties. So when you have fundamental powers such as uh, mass, charge, and spin, then you don't need other properties in virtue of which a bearer of these powers must possess them in order to have the powers. So what is interesting of this approach is that it's consistent with the idea that mass, charge, and spin are grounded in, other, in entities that belong to other categories, such as structures. So you could say that powers are ungrounded relative to the category of properties, but not absolutely ungrounded. So they might be grounded in symmetry structures. So this positionalism and this approach would not clash with uh, symmetry considerations. The disadvantage of this approach is that, uh, the conservative approach is that powers would not be absolutely fundamental. So they would be fundamental in a weak category relative sense. And I think that this is problematic because uh, you might think this positionalism as a theory of the most basic fundamental constituents of reality. So you might think that this, this positionalist is interested in giving account of the absolutely fundamental properties of reality. Another approach is a reformist one. And the idea here is to adopt a framework of fundamentality that permits us to have fundamental yet grounded entities. One way to do so is to adopt the primitivist fundamentality framework like the one defended by Jessica Wilson. So on this view, what you think uh, of the fundamentality is in primitive terms. So you take that the fundamental cannot be understood in terms of other metaphysical notions. So you adopt rather a kind of all God had to create or axiomatic conceptions of fundamental power. So you take the fundamental powers are those that God had to create or are the axioms of your theory or something like that. 
one of the claim advantages of the primitive fun fundamentality framework is that you can have things that are fundamental and yet dependent on something else. So if you adopt this view, then powers can be regarded as absolutely fundamental and yet grounded in symmetry structure. So you would have a way to address the uh, ungroundedness worry. A disadvantage is that the reformist approach is ideologically costly because we need to invoke two primitive notions, one of grounding and the other of fundamentality. So this is, of course, is a cost of the strategy. Here's just a note about this. Uh, I think that it might be worth flagging that the dispositionalists may have independent reasons for being a primitivist. And I argue elsewhere that, I, uh, that there are or motivations related to the metaphysics of powers for being a primitivist about their fundamentality. And just have a, as a wee note of self-promotions, I'm going to give a talk in mid-October about the fundamentality of fundamental powers. So if you are interested, feel free to get in touch. But anyway, so I propose these two remedies about uh, intrinsicality and ungroundedness worries. So the idea is to accept the extrinsicality of fundamental powers and then accept a view that permits to have fundamental yet grounded powers to uh, better fit the scientific evidence. So the idea is that both the proposed remedies are motivated by scientific responsibility. It is scientific findings that inform these features. And so what is important, however, is that dispositionalism would still be the view that many or all fundamental properties are powers. It's just that these fundamental powers could be both extrinsic and grounded. Now, an obvious question is, are all the features of powers fully determined by scientific observations and theorizing? And I want to suggest that the answer is, is negative. And so no, dispositionalism is not a fully naturalistic metaphysic. In a recent paper, and to relate it with the theme of the conference, uh, Thomas Attacco and Matteo Morganti uh, describe a moderate naturalistic metaphysic as the view according to which the a posteriori and a priori elements are not subordinated one to the other and instead enter relations of mutual support and complementarily. So what I want to suggest is that a scientifically responsible versions of dispositionalism is moderately naturalistic. For some features of powers, we start from science and then go back to the metaphysic black hole. So think of intrinsicality and uh, uh, the groundedness claim. So the idea is that you, you look at science, you look at the scientific fi sci findings, and then you go back to the metaphysics of dispositionalism. Mm -hmm. So that's why you don't take intrinsicality to be a features of power, but rather you adopt extrinsicality because our science tells us that the powers are extrinsic. But for other features of powers, we proceed the other way around. So think uh, again, of, think well, actually think, for example, of the various uh, notion, metaphysical notion that are related to the metaphysics of powers or the, the dispositional essence or the modal force of powers or the individuation criteria of powers or the relation between powers and their causal profile. All of, all of, these, all of these notions are uh, things that we start first from the armchair as it were, and then we look at the science and see how they fit. What is crucial, I think, it is the continuous interaction between the a posteriori and the a priori elements of dispositionalism that yields the best scientifically responsible versions of this view. So I think that there's, a, there's an interesting mutual uh, relationship between science and, and metaphysics when it comes to dispositionalism. So science ought to inform the metaphysics of dispositionalism, and the metaphysics of dispositionalism ought to provide an explanatory framework for scientific findings. So here, here you have how the pictures would look like. So we have science and what I call armchair dispositionalism, and then you have this sort of mutual interactions that is supposed to be represented by the two arrows. Now, of course, there's, a, there's an interesting methodological question on how to spell out the content of these arrows. So I would like to hear from the audience some uh, possible options. But uh, this is basically the kind of pictures that I have in mind. So to conclude, uh, a scientifically responsible versions of dispositionalism is one which does not fear to abandon certain metaphysical commitments for accommodating what our best science tells us about the structure of reality we inhabit. But I also think, and this is important to stress, that 
if scientifically responsible versions of this positionalism aspires to be the best frameworks of fundamental property, then it might also possess a solid metaphysical architectures. And thus, these positionalists should not neglect a priori metaphysical work to characterize powers. And that's all. Thanks.